I'm super excited to be joining you today. I am going to be talking about prerequisites for chaos engineering. I'm sharing my screen here on, on my large monitor just so I can uh, confirm that we're all good. Everyone's seeing yep. my slides here. Excellent. Looks great. Fantastic. So thank you for the very kind intro. A um, little bit about me. I think I met Casey, oh man, I don't know how many years ago now, back when I was uh, chairing the Velocity Conference at O'Reilly Media. Um, and I, I've uh, swum the wilds of a few startups and landed back here, which I'm really excited about. Uh, my informal title is Internet Incident Librarian, um, but you can call me a research analyst if you want. I'll talk a little bit more about what I'm doing maybe at the end. Um, so to talk a bit about uh, chaos engineering, I know there was a great panel on sort of getting started. So some of these things might have come up previously, um, but I wanted to, before I get into talking about actual prerequisites for chaos engineering, I wanted to dispel a couple of myths or false prerequisites of chaos engineering. So we'll start with the first one that we hear a lot, um, which is that you have to be like wizard 10 level to be doing chaos engineering. Uh, people often uh, remark about Netflix and, uh, and other like large companies like Google, who we are about to hear from, um, and the kinds of practices they have in place. But the, the fact of the matter is that Netflix is where it is now because of chaos engineering. So, so chaos engineering was born out of Netflix's transformation from the data center to the cloud. And at the time, Netflix didn't have a stellar reputation for their availability. And they have that reputation now by adopting chaos engineering, by starting to experiment with this, putting it into practice and helping them build more stable systems. So in many ways, if you look at the outcome, you realize you also could start there and get to a reliability level uh, of the likes of potentially Netflix someday. And the other point I wanted to make about this is that other companies have undertaken chaos engineering as a part of tr sort of traditional digital transformations from data center to the cloud, um, even including those in like highly regulated industries like healthcare, United Healthcare, and other kinds of companies like that. And even finance and banking, Capital One, and a variety of banks are the types of organizations, even being in highly regulated industries, that are finding that starting with chaos engineering is actually helping them transform into the cloud and to better understand how the, you know, the complexity of the systems that they're building. So that's myth number one. And, and underpinning that myth to a certain degree is the notion that um, chaos engineering is breaking things, right? And really what it is, is it's a practice of experimentation. It helps you understand the, the safety boundaries of your system um, and when you're kind of drifting towards those boundaries and that, and that term drifting might sound familiar to folks uh, if you're familiar at all with Sidney Decker's concept of, of drifting into failure. And I just included one slide about that and I have a link here if you're interested in this book and it'll be at the end of the slides again about resources. Um, but this is that you have such a complex system and it's adaptive. It's adaptive in part because you all are a part of it and you're reacting to all kinds of sort of competitive and complexity kinds of situations. And that has you constantly making these trade-offs between, you know, sort of resources, scarcity, pressures, and conflicting goals within and out outside of your organization. And people make trade-offs based on those constraints. And those trade-offs start to push you in those directions of your safety boundaries, but it's so complex, you can't necessarily see that that's happening. And, and in the book, um, Decker talks a lot about how those things happen and lead to um, really significant events like the, the Challenger explosion or BP Deepwater Horizons explosion. So chaos engineering, and this is, these are obviously very extreme scenarios, but helps you tell when you're sort of tiptoeing towards that cliff because you don't know where it is until you fall off of it and you have some kind of an outage or an incident. So uh, myth number two that I wanted to get to um, is that it introduces chaos into your already potentially chaotic systems. Um, and I, have, I feel like if I talk about chaos, I always have to talk about Loki. Also, my children are obsessed with Marvel right now. So all of my references are largely um, like that. And so it's not about injecting chaos into your systems. Chaos engineering is about seeing the chaos that already exists in your systems, um, much like Thor recognizes about his brother. Um, 
and, and I wanted to harken back a little bit to, to the folks we're talking about. I was talking about a couple slides ago about like healthcare and, and, and finance orgs. Um, when, K, when Casey and folks started the uh, chaos community days, I think I went to the second one. I'm trying to remember back in Seattle um, at the AWS building. There, there weren't a lot of like banking or healthcare folks there. It was kind of core internet kinds of companies and folks, you know, starting to um, explore chaos engineering and, and heard a lot of comments from folks who didn't come like, well, you know, you've got your fancy entertainment companies, you know, you've got TV shows, whatever, like we've got real money or lives on the line, but they were also having outages. So there was chaos in their systems, whether they wanted to admit it or not, the consequences might be higher, but that doesn't mean that, you know, you shouldn't still be paying attention to and trying to understand that complexity in your system. Um, and I think that the biggest piece I wanted to say about, about this particular myth is also that chaos engineering isn't some sort of, in some ways it's like fancy new made up thing. It's really borrowing from a long tradition of using experimentation to uh, confirm or refute hypotheses you might have about your system. And, and so in that, in that way, I mean, kind of hearkening to the, the healthcare notion, chaos engineering borrows from the same approach as you might see for clinical trials. And I know everybody thinks about like right now, all we can think about is clinical trials for vaccines, but for anything really that you're going to introduce into a complex system like humans and human bodies, you run through a very you know, smart and carefully thought through process of experimentation and understanding the impacts of those changes have on your systems. So two myths. Now let's get to the actual real prerequisites of chaos engineering. It, you, there are a few things you do want to make sure you have in place. The good news is they're good things to be doing regardless of whether you want to start with chaos or engineering or not. So I'm going to just put this slide up for, and that shows all four of them, and then we'll walk through each one of them one by one. So the four prerequisites for chaos engineering are instrumentation to be able to detect degraded states in your system, social awareness of anybody who might be involved in any kinds of chaos engineering uh, practices that you're starting, expectations amongst everyone that the hypotheses you have actually will be upheld. And we'll get to that one in a minute because it's a little, it's a little nuanced. And then alignment amongst those groups of people to respond, to actually do something based on what you learn from your experiments. So start with the first one, instrumentation. So it's, you do need to be able to detect differences in de degradation between a control group and an experimental group. Um, and I don't know how much of this had might have been covered before, but in the general principle of like, you know, high school science classes, you probably even learned about, you have a control group where you don't change anything. That's the current steady state of whatever's happening with your systems. And then you introduce an experimental change. That's your experimental group. And then you compare the two. And if you don't have the instrumentation to actually detect any differences there, well, I mean, it's, it's a tree falling in the forest, right? Like you're running an experiment and you don't even have any way of understanding what's actually happening. Um, but there's a, there's a hidden myth in here, actually. So it's really three myths that you need to have some kind of sort of pro-grade observability tooling in place in order to, to detect these kinds of changes in your systems. And I mean, we love honeycomb folks all, you know, they're great. We're not saying that observability isn't a good thing. It's, it's a lovely thing, but it's not a prerequisite for chaos engineering, even really simple, basic kinds of logging and metrics, things that will allow you to understand is your system up? Is it down? Things that odds are you probably already have in place, but if not, it's, really great for you and your team and your system anyways to have those things. So some form of instrumentation, basic metrics, logging, and you're good to go to get on to the next prerequisite. So the next prerequisite is, a, is more of a cultural side of this or a social side of what we often refer to as like social technical systems. So Anybody as a parent will probably be very familiar with this phenomenon. Like if you just suddenly decide to kind of like change the rules and expect everybody to just like roll along with it, um, you know how painful that is. So you really need buy-in from anyone who's going to is either working on or touched by some of these systems that you might be experimenting with. Um, because running experiments without telling people 
it, it might feel like, oh, we'll just, we'll, we'll sneak it in there. It'll be great. And then we'll have the results and we can show everyone how great it is. But the fact of the matter is, if there is any kind of an impact, um, even in outside of production systems, you're only going to create animosity and resistance and frustration for any future chaos engineering efforts that you want to that you want to undertake. Um, so it being, you know, letting people know what's being done, why, to what end, and the expectations for the outcome. Um, and so it's really important to build that consensus before you start experimenting. Um, and the good news is you, you don't need Bitcoin. Um, you, just, you just need to talk to people. So hopefully that will work out for you. Third prerequisite of chaos engineering. So back to hypotheses. Um, you have your control group, you have your experimental group, and you don't just sort of like see what happens. You should be designing experiments that have a hypothesis about what's going to happen based on what you already do know about your systems. You all are the operators. You're at the, the sharp end of the stick about how these things work. So you should be the best people to come up with some hypotheses about what is going to happen when you change something in that system. But this isn't about breaking things. This is about learning about your system. And so if you know that things are already broken, then having, you know, an experiment that only confirms that it doesn't give you any new knowledge, right? So you really want to fix what's broken in a particular system. If you know, like, like you don't have security control, the right security, you know, controls on your login page or whatnot, right? Get those things dialed. This doesn't mean fix every broken thing. Um, so you, then you're like, well, forget it. Like that's the worst prerequisite to chaos engineering ever. We know we have all, you know, X, Y, Z going on across all these things. Thinking about the system or the area that you want to start with, with chaos engineering, if there are known broken things there, go fix those. Cause they're not going to help you learn anything. They're going to be the only thing you keep relearning over and over again um, as you try to conduct experiments. So the other, so then I wanted to just talk a little bit about hypothesis to uphold. Um, so what you don't want to do is create some really wildly unrealistic situation, you know, out of the gate. Um, you want an honest expectation, actually, that your hypothesis will be upheld. Um, so, you know, if you, if you are in a position where you have very specific service level, um, you know, SLOs, you want to have hypotheses like, this service will meet all SLOs, even under conditions of high latency with the data layer or something, whatever it is you know about, you should expect from that system, right? So have well-formed hypotheses in a system that you have spent some time making sure you don't have, your experiments are just gonna confirm broken things. That's the third. So fourth prerequisite of chaos engineering is another cultural or socio-technical piece of the puzzle, which is that you have alignment to respond. So whoever's involved in doing this work should be prepared to do something when you learn something. This one can sound also kind of big, right? Like, oh, geez, you know, I got to get buy-in and then I got to get buy-in again. Um, and, and, and it's at the end of the, of the experiment, right? It can feel like, well, sure, but I have a million other things to do and everyone else involved is going to potentially feel that way. And we get, we get that. Sometimes this is where chaos engineering um, efforts can like die on the vine. But odds are you have some mechanisms in place that you can kind of anchor these things to. Um, so if you can align your chaos engineering efforts with things like your CI CD practices and tooling, then that's something that, that people are familiar with. And you've already probably asked them to sort of make the leap and make the, you know, sort of the transformation to that set of practices. And you can sort of slide this in with that instead of making it some big, huge other thing that everybody has to all get on board with this massive chaos engineering program. Um, but I do think this is a really critical prerequisite um, because it's really the people who are doing the work, um, the people who understand your systems the best and who see these results that are going to be the ones who can, and, you know, sort of reason about the results and make the appropriate changes. We, we often refer to this as sort of the above the line processes of how we manage complex systems. And I just wanted to include one slide about this because this is, I've always found this helps me really think about those kinds of differences. We, we often tend to 
think about this below the line kinds of work as the work we do, right? Um, there's all of the testing we do and the code stuff and, you know, all of the sort of tools and the technology and the infrastructure and all of that. And we've been talking about some of that today. But part of the reason why your systems work and the way you're going to, you know, you learn and reason about them is all of this, what's called above the line kinds of work, which is largely cognitive, collaborative, joint activity amongst all these people who run and, and, and maintain and understand these systems. And if you don't have buy-in from those folks to, to do something, not just to do the experiment, but then to like discuss and agree about what kinds of changes you're going to make, you're going to have some great experimental results. You will have learned something about your system. That part is great. Um, but you won't have necessarily put that learning into practice. And so getting everyone sort of bought in on, on what they're doing above the line um, based on those experiments is, is really important. And I like to refer to this as um, your cultural infrastructure. Um, so trying to think about that above the line infrastructure and not just the actual technical infrastructure. If you get that in the right place, then you're going to be much more likely to be able to really take advantage of any kinds of uh, chaos engineering efforts you undertake. So I've got a couple of minutes left and I just wanted to shift gears a little bit from sort of philosophical discussions about um, how, to, you know, sort of how to get started with this. And I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the early data that I've been collecting in my research efforts at Verica. Um, in particular at Verica, we're really interested in right now, we're looking a lot at Kubernetes and Kafka, two technologies that um, are obviously seeing huge amounts of adoption, a lot of usage, um, and they're also complex and uh, people have had all kinds of pain <laughs> and people are running massive production systems on top of these technologies. So, so we, I started by talking to folks who are working largely with one either or, or, or both and trying to understand sort of the environments in which they're operating and what, how they're thinking about chaos engineering in, in their organizations. Um, this isn't a large sample set. Like I said, these are kind of early days as, as I'm, I'm firing up research at Verica. So I, we talked to about 50 organizations roughly, I would say. So I'm not slapping any kinds of like statistical significance on these. These are just directional um, data. But um, what we found was obviously, since I wanted to talk to people who are doing these things, most of the people I talked to were using either Kubernetes or Kafka. Um, quite a few actually though are using both and they're using them in production um, uh, extensively in some cases. And it's across a wide range of, of industries, not surprising that you would see a lot of sort of technology companies, but the second biggest industry we talked to were people in financial services um, who are running, you know, things on top of Kubernetes or Kafka. Uh, and a wide range of roles as well. I honestly expected, you know, not surprising to see a lot of sort of DevOps and SRE type folks and software engineers. We talked to architects, information security folks, um, management and executive people. So this was great to see because it meant there's sort of like a range of folks across these organizations who are involved or who are thinking about this and across a big size of organizations and, as well. And in fact, the largest group of companies we talked to were in like sort of this massive, you know, 10,000 or a larger set of folks. So a really nice sort of broad representative group of them. And what was really interesting to me was the, these are self, these are self ratings of folks that we talked to. So we asked them um, to, to assess their own level of experience with I, both Kafka or Kubernetes. And over half of almost actually two thirds of folks running Kafka put themselves as novice or beginner users and a little under half is the situation there with Kubernetes. Um, so these are people who are, they're not, like I said, you know, joking wizard level 10 types of folks, but they're running this stuff in production or they're, you know, they've got some production workloads, they've got a bunch of stuff in dev and test and they're continuing to kind of move these things out um, to help run their systems. And the most interesting, I think, combination of all of those pieces of data is that 83% of them are hoping to start some kind of chaos engineering program this year. So they're not wizard level. Um, they are pushing out a lot of really complex systems um, in production and they're, they're realizing that they can kind of gain that same kind of confidence that Netflix gamed over time by starting earlier 
with chaos engineering um, and uh, in, in, in their systems. So that was really reassuring to me because I think it means that people are starting to understand you know, some of those myths just really uh, aren't true. So I think we've already talked about some of these. So I'm going to just do one last slide pretty quickly. Um, I, there, game days are a really great way to get started with chaos engineering at your organization. Um, you know, you don't have to make it sophisticated. Most engineering teams or groups are really kind of familiar with the concept of a, of a game day or even like a hackathon. Um, and you can set up something really small and focused and it doesn't take as many people to get the buy-in, especially if you kind of start with a system that's, you know, smaller or, you know, not as, as sprawled in terms of, of what you're running at your organization. Um, and you don't have to do this in production. I think that's sub myth or, you know, number four, um, Insights can come from conducting experiments first in a test or a staging environment. Um, sure, more sophisticated programs end up operating in production, but that really is an advanced principle and moving more towards like wizard level 10 status. You can get critical insights from running experiments and staging or a test environment. And if you can be safe about it, then please, you know, by all means do. And there was a panel on getting started with chaos engineering. So if you missed that, you can go back and, and find the recording um, on that. And uh, uh, if you want your game day to work well, don't invite cats because they're jerks and they like to knock things off tables. Um, closing slide. Uh, here are some resources that are for you to get started with chaos engineering. Um, we're offering a free copy of the chaos engineering book that Casey and Nora wrote. Uh, I got some links for the chaos community broadcast that we do uh, drift into failure. I didn't mention Richard Cook's how complex systems fail, but if you drift into failure stuff has like your ears poking up, I highly recommend that. These are all links um, in the slides that will be available after the fact and stay in touch. I'm like I said, I'm just getting started with research at Verica. I love talking to people about what they're doing, what's happening in their systems. Um, I'm starting to work on uh, some rather large resources around internet uh, failure write-ups and those kinds of things. So just looking forward to getting people involved with what I'm working on. Here's some info on how you can find me. And if you're getting started sort of on your own tooling and that journey, uh, folks here at Verica would of course obviously love to talk to you and hear from that.